Hello? Okay, great. I think we're going to start now. So, um, okay, first of all, I should point out right away that those of you who came here expecting to see Billy Tang and Nadim Abbas on this panel, I'm very sorry, unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, they are unable to make the panel. So I've stepped in to moderate. Um, uh, but I want to really honor Billy here because we worked very closely on the discussions around this topic and why we wanted to do a panel um, like this for this particular year in Hong Kong is the fair as Art Basel comes back and Hong Kong opens up. And we, we really try to understand where we're situated um, in this current moment. Um, and of course, the topic of discussion is Sinofuturism, which it itself is a very contested term and quite a loaded and problematic term. And I wanted to begin by um, sort of giving a shout out to the writer Gary Jeshi Zheng, um, who wrote a beautiful piece in Freeze. And he quoted um, A Jiao. He was talking with A Jiao, and they were saying how, well, A Jiao was arguing that contemporary China lacks a prevailing theory of modernity, and without this methodology, Sino futurism orbits around a Euro American planet, manifesting either as a diasporic fantasy or a nightmarish return of the colonial repressed, and I'm quoting Gary, but also it has often come across as an orientalist projection or sometimes just quite an easy and reductive trope to encapsulate the full complexity of what the actual existing futurisms that define greater China, the Chinese world, and more broadly the world itself, because of course there are many different futurisms as well. So with that in mind, and within the context of this rapidly shifting global context that we're all living through, which we have many terms to define, to, to, there have been many terms to define it, sort of post-truth, post-digital, uh, post-human. Um, this conversation is really seen as a starting point. And with Billy, we've said that today, we're going to really ground this in curatorial and artistic practice. And from there, we'll see where the conversation goes and we'll see what terms come emerge or we'll discover the nuances of how each of us understand these terms that have been used to define certain conditions. So with that being said, um, we thought that we have a slide. So guys, can we put the slides on rotation, please? Awesome. So there's going to be images on rotation. There's a, you'll be able to see them, and, and the artists and the curators will be talking to them. Um, so it's with that introduction, with that being said, it's my great honor to introduce this panel. Um, we have artist Shuang Li, curator Wu Jian Ru, and Freya Chu, who's one of the co-curators of the next Taipei Biennial. And to open the talk, I wanted to invite each speaker to respond to how you understand or position yourselves within the discourse of Sinofuturism and if you wish to confront that also, the, the term greater China, which itself is also as contentious a, a word as, as Sinofuturism. So I thought we could start with Jan Ru. Uh, so um, I, want, I, I want to use... <laughs> oh, uh, sure, yeah. I want to use Chinese to respond. Thank you. Because 呃，因为这个话题非常有趣，它是呃关于一个呃自我身份的认知的一个问题，所以也许呃普通话对于我讲自己的呃实践更加的呃呃顺顺畅一点。嗯呃，其实我之前是一直在做呃媒体或者写作的事情。呃，二零一九年的时候，呃，我就呃。加加入了一个美术馆，叫时代美术馆。就在上一个环节，大家都有听到的这个美术馆，它目前已经关门了。然后，嗯，在这个，其实，在接到这个工作的时候，非常有意思，就是他们希望，嗯，他们希望我的加入可以去，嗯，做一个新的部门，叫 Media Lab， 就是希望是回应一个当下，呃，所谓科技和艺术相关的一个议题。
？呃，因为这个议题一直的非常一一直非常火，嗯，尤其是近几年在这种科技叙事非常强势的一个情况下，所以我在一九年加入的时候，啊、呃，但其实我做的第一个事情是做了美术馆的一个呃数字平台，啊、呃，因为嗯、呃，我我个人就是。关注的嗯、呃、事情是，除了在一个实体空间里面去做展览啊、呃，我认为在未来更多的这个作品的传播和被阅读将会是在一个虚拟空间里面实现。所以我的第一个项目实际上是做了嗯、呃、时代美术馆现在我们能够看到的这个官网啊、呃，然后在这个过程中，其实我就有嗯、呃、去跟本地的很多艺术家和不同的这个策展人去。聊就是看我们需要一个什么样的基建，呃，然后我再去回到自己做 media lab 的这个工作里面，嗯，然后再接着我开始做 media lab 的工作的时候，呃，我其实也是从一个数字平台开始，因为其实我呃，我认为在做嗯整一个工作的过程中，就是。呃，先搭一个结构非常重要，但这个搭这个结构的时候，我们会遇到诸多的问题，然后就会回到我们要聊的这个关于 sino futurism 的问题，就是我们如何去重新呃书写地方这个事情，因为在我们在谈论地方的时候，呃，我发现在珠三角是有它的传统的，嗯、呃，比方说我们现在讲的这个呃珠三角，实际上现在已经不叫珠三角，现在叫大湾区。但它实际上是，嗯，我们都知道，一九九六年的时候，库哈斯有带着他的哈佛建筑系的学生到珠三角去考察，写了一本书叫《大跃进》，然后他把这种啊、呃、无序的、有机的这种城市面貌，呃，称之为一个极度，呃，应该叫，呃，那个英文的词应该是 a city of， 呃 e x a c e r b a t e d difference， 就是一个非常，那个叫什么？凡是一个非常，呃，无序的城市之类的，然后，呃，他他实际上他的这种论述几乎垄断了我们过去二十年对整一个大湾区的一个呃文化景观的一个看法，就是我们怎么去论述大湾区这个地方，很多时候是从，呃，库哈斯来的，就是库哈斯和他的团队来的，因为，呃，以他的以以他的工作还有他的这个传播的力度。啊、呃，他几乎，嗯，他的工作就是把很多一些，嗯、呃，他他的论述里面的这这种东西给放大了。所以说从，从而且他是在一个西方的视角去讲这件事情，所以他的这个，所以他的他的论述会影响我们后面十几年的这这些工作，包括艺术家在做什么事情的时候，很容易会被引用到这种所谓无序的，是东方主义式的一种一种。图像的这个语境下面来，嗯，所以我在开始在做我工作的时候，呃，我会想去，因为其实我也是关注技术和媒介这个议题，所以其实我会想去重新发明一些，呃，方式去，嗯、呃，去书写这个地方，呃，所以我，呃，因为许许玉是呃 Media Lab 的呃顾问，是他从第一天开始就我们就在一起合作，嗯，这有三年的时间。所以我们第一个项目实际上做的是一个叫呃呃大湾区关键词，我们其实是列举了过去我们能够找到的呃四五十个词，就是大家非常熟悉的，像啊、呃、这种 sino p i t u r e 上面在里面，然后还有这种自动驾驶、人工智能，呃对，就是大家可以在屏幕上面看到这些，还有 digital labor， 就我们将非常多的这些啊、呃、关键词。找出来，然后我们再让今天的作者去重新去书写他们，其实是从一个呃相对于虚构、虚构和想象的层面去啊、呃、去去再看这个地方。嗯，因为实际上呃在库哈斯的论述里面，呃整个珠三角它是作为呃它它其实是作为世界工厂的一部分，但在今天大湾区它是自上而下的这么重新被命名。嗯、呃，它是重新被放到一个全球的交流，呃，全球的一个呃经济实体，因为它对对标的是这个世界上呃其他四大湾区嘛，所以它是放在一个经济实体的这个视角上被被重新的去论述的，而且这种论述是自上而下的，就是由国家出发的一个一个论述。
，所以呢，他是他是嗯、呃，他是彻底是跟。过去的呃，不管过去只有西方如何看待这个地方，它是完全是另外一种视角，嗯，所以在这个角度，呃，所所以就是这个是我们的第一部分的工作，呃，有了这些关键词，然后有了这些跟不同的呃学者的讨论，我们再来重新观察这片地方，我们如何从一种嗯、呃、一种这种呃个体，在这种呃新自由主义体系下的挣扎。呃，重新呃进入到目前我们讲的这些人和机器的呃之间的抗争，还有呃这种呃人和人工智能之间的一种呃抗衡之中来，所以这个是呃呃做 Media Lab 的一个比较早期的一个工作，然后其实后面我们呃我又组织了一次这种呃这种科技田野考察，呃有邀请到七八个艺术家一起去。到像腾讯、华为，还有虎牙这些大的科技公司，去跟他们的一些技术人员对话。其实这个层面就是说，我们也希望从一个非常，嗯、呃，在地的层面去真实的了解，呃，我们面临的、面对的这些问题是什么。然、呃、后，而且希望是从艺术家的角度去重新书写它。啊、呃，然后这个这两个项目，呃，我认为是，我认为是可以稍微回应一下。嗯、um, ，我对于 s i n o f u t u r i s m 的理解，呃，因为我们平时不太不太讲这个词，啊、呃，但是我们的实际的工作中都在处处面临着，嗯，关于自我的定义，关于嗯，如呃西方如何看待啊、呃，如何看待我们，然后还有在在这种大国的博弈之间，这些艺术家的作品如何是去找到一个主体性的问题，嗯，所以嗯，也许这个只是一个非常。简短的一个开场，然后呃，我想在一些像李爽的作品，就在艺术家的创作里面，会有更多更低调的东西可以讲。Thank you, I agree, and I think you know I, maybe I should be very transparent here because when you talk about sort of geopolitical conflict, I should say that I'm Eurasian, so it's kind of embodied. But I feel like you know that complexity、um, is kind of what. You know, when you mentioned Rem Koolhaas and the, city, the description of the city of exacerbated difference, it sort of speaks to that desire to hold or to contain a disorder or chaos, right? Because it's like a human need to understand or at least to have something become legible when it's so complicated. And it made me think about、um, two things, and I think you're right, Jan Ru, like to ground this、um, not only in. Actual places and times, but in practices, so that it's never a projection. And、um, it made me think about Lawrence Leck, who we all know, and who's really spoken a lot about sinofuturism. And he has a video essay on this, and he describes sinofuturism as an invisible movement, a specter already embedded in a trillion industrial products, a billion individuals, and a million veiled narratives. And I think the veiled is really important here. Sometimes it's about what we don't see because there's so much. Um, and I'm quoting Lawrence.、Uh, I'll continue quoting him. him. He says,、uh, "Sinofuturism is a movement not based on individuals, but on multiple overlapping flows, flows of populations, of products and processes." And、mm. it immediately reminded me of Gulf Futurism,、um, which was coined by artists Sofia Almeria and Fatima Al Kadiri in the 2010s, around that time. And it was a way for、uh, to kind of really understand the rapid modernization that was happening in the Gulf,、um, for example, in Dubai,、um, which whose whose model is very famously based on Singapore. So it's like this kind of like the construction of these metropolises effectively, and the sort of containment of commercial culture and capital into a new kind of neoliberal paradigm. To, to drop that dirty word, neoliberalism.、Um, And Erica Balsam, the writer, she describes golf.、Uh, she she says this about golf futurism: the fractured, non-linear temporality embedded in the notion of golf futurism encompasses both gleaming skyscrapers, so from the very massive high rises that just define cities, and the harsh conditions faced by the migrant labor laborers who built them. But then, of course, we can think about the earth. Right, so for our Al Kasimi, who's a, an Emirati artist, just did a beautiful work、um, that was really commenting on the loss of culture and the loss of memory by and the destruction of、um, ecological sites because of development. So the reason I bring this up、um, in relation in relation to Shuangli 
is um, I think in your work, and I would really love to hear more about it, you sort of really play with these kinds of collapsings, right? Or, and these expansions, like the sort of uncontrollable space and time and the possibilities of what the digital world can be um, as a medium through which to actually understand physicality or physical experience within this kind of singularity, dare I say. Yeah, thank you for the question. So actually when these terms like Sino-Futurism or like Gold Futurism, when they first were coined, I was still in school. And I remember for the first time seeing Sophia Elmeria's work at the Whitney, um, her Black Friday installation. I was so inspired. Um, I remember going to the exhibition and looking at her work. I was thinking maybe this is something I want to make too. Um, Looking back, I'm not sure if it was consciously inspired because of these perspectives per se. Um, it was, yeah, by her storytelling, by her installation, and by her just way of working. But um, in terms of myself, so I grew up in like a really small town in Southeast China, and it was really boring. There was nothing to do. Um, so when I was a kid, I would spend most of my time like playing video games and reading. When I was a bit older, like a teenager, um, I would spend all my time on online, basically. Like um, that's where I found all this like American emo punk band, and I found. I feel like yeah, um, that's something I've never been related to more in my life. But now I realize why because. All these like emo bands, they're all like kids from like suburbia in America. And all their songs were about like, they're just like screaming about getting out of there. Um, and back then I don't speak English. So, and this is probably the only lie that I understood. It's like, I wanna get out of here and like something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think because of, uh, because of this, experience, um, a lot of my work, they are like videos, they are digital, because I wanted to escape not just immediate surrounding, but also my own body. Um, and later, after, after COVID, actually at the beginning of COVID, um, in February 2020, I had a show with Perez Projects in Berlin. Um, so I went to Berlin, but that's when COVID broke out and the travel restrictions were carried out and I couldn't come back. So I just stayed there since then. Um, and I was like moving constantly because I didn't plan to be there long term, but because of the circumstances that I have to stay. So I was moving like all the time. And one night I was moving into like a new Airbnb of that month and it was a, um, there was like a courtyard and they have this like sound activating like lighting system. And I was like moving in there by myself at like 9 p.m. or something. And then as soon as I step into the courtyard, like all the lights lit up for me. <laughs> and then <laughs> it was an epiphany moment that I saw like myself and my shadow. And that was a moment that I was like, wow, I would never be able to escape my own body. And from that moment on, I started become like more interested in like physicality and mater materiality. Um, I love how you basically found commonality because I know I, I, I there's, we have this work here. This is deja vu, but that's actually a, a performance, Lord of the Flies, right? Yes. And they're wearing that something that's based on My Chemical Romance, which is how you learned English, right? Yes. And so you found that commonality, um, I want to get out of here, right? And that's so interesting when you think about it in relation to the screen and you know the digital environment and digital cultures, because what you effectively described was a post-national relationality. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I wonder if you could maybe talk about that a little bit more, because that work in particular, Deja Vu, was a way for you to kind of really think about that dislocation, yeah. but then finding another center or another ground through that dislocation. And I think that's kind of interesting when we think about the subject of this talk, which is being between the real yeah. and the virtual. And as we discussed earlier, like effectively, I think what we're trying to map isn't 
just the after of after Sinofuturism, but what actually exists between the real and the virtual now as we experience it? Um, I think for the past three years, one of the main thing I've been dealing with or like processing is this dislocation. But like um, on the one hand, there are a lot of trauma that happened, like collective trauma that I wasn't like that was physically not I was physically absent from. Like I've never been locked in my home for like three months, um, but I experienced it in a different way. I I. My situation was like, I, I don't have a home for a very long time. And I kept moving and, um, but like no matter where you move to, like this political depression is always hovering like a dark crowd. So um, yeah, I have to process this duality like for my own sanity basically. So when the performance Lord of the Fly happens, it was at the beginning of 2022 at Antenna Space. So I think at that time, a lot of my friends from Shanghai, they are um, they decided to move away. And I, um, I had this group show, so I hired like 20 people to dress up like me. And um, they are given a set of instructions on how to interact with audience. But also, I wrote like a lot of personal letters to my close friends who are moving away, and um, each performer they were planted with a letter. Before before the performance happened, they were like shown a picture of this friend who the letter is addressed to. So when the friend came, they were like call their name and then hug them and read the letter and say goodbye for me, basically. Um, so I think. I'm like really happy about this performance. It, it was very intense, even though that wasn't there. Um, but I'm happy I found a way to process. Yeah, um, I wanna get to Freya, but before, because we're gonna go a different tangent when we get to you. I wanted to come back to Jan Ru and maybe also to Shuangli and Freya chime in as well. Like I'm super curious then what I'm getting from you, um, Shuang, is how the digital sphere offered an escape, not just for you personally, but it's sort of a site of escape. It's a site of possible realignment. Um, and we had talked earlier about, you know, this question of Sinofuturism and the kind of fetishization of the future can often just be a way to bypass the, pr the problem of dealing with the present. Um, and Janru, I wonder if this, how this has come out in your work um, with Media Lab, you know, with the way that you're actively engaging in the digital space, not just as a physical space or a network space, but sort of a state of mind as well. Um, um 所以这个是我工作的一个在空间里面发生的一个项目 
Um, thank you. And that's like actually a really perfect um, segue because you mentioned this irreversible process, which sort of relates to the accelerationism that's kind of embedded into this idea of not just Sinofuturism, but other futurisms. Um, and then, you know, how this, if it's an irreversible process, how do you deal with the merging or the collapsing of the real and the virtual? And I think this is kind of almost what you're pushing back on, Freya, um, with the Taipei Biennial um, small world. So I wonder if you can maybe introduce this position, because it was very timely when you released it, thinking about this panel. Um. <笑>我加入讲中文我觉得 他们在解释他们正在做的事情那我们其实那时候就想到了这个我不知道大家熟不熟悉就是 Plato's Cave这个概念 就是Plato他提出了这个 Cave的一个 它是一个allegory一个预言 就是在这个洞穴里面呢 就是有很多的prisoners 他们是被困在这个Cave里面的 那他们其实是有脚链是把他们绑住所以他们是没有办法离开这个洞穴那他们对于在这个洞穴里面这个洞穴它有一个出口可是他们是看不到的那他们对这个洞穴里面他们所看到的东西都是外面的人事物的经过可在洞穴中间呢它有一个火有一个火苗在那里所以这些在洞穴里
原来之前是看不到的，可是当这个世界就是 in this shrinking world， 我们想突然之间会看到一些我们熟悉的世界，但其实它其实是不熟悉的。那这个重复的去观看，或者再一次的去发现一些既有存在，可是我们可以用不同的方式去一个新的一个政治想象，是我们这次双人展希望可以提出的方法。那我们提出的方法有很多，嗯，主要有一个很重要的一个切入点，就是透过音乐。那音乐它除了是一个我们人最 private 的一个 feeling 之外，音乐对我们而言，它其实也是关于 machine。这个 machine 它，你可以去讨论它关于呃、uh, recording、playback、amplification、distribution， 就是到底我们人跟机器或是跟技术之间的关系是什么？那也许我先停留在这边。Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to stay on that. This idea of like the trauma of having the real world revealed to you and you're not able to escape it, which kind of made me think about Yu Shuang and what you were saying、um, earlier. And I think that sort of comes back to、uh, the subject of this talk, which I'm going to probe just a little bit before we try to go beyond it, right? Which is that concept of sinofuturism,、um, and that idea that what does it cover? What does it conceal? You know, what does it veil? And if I, I and of course I have to bring Billy back in. You know, Billy's one of Billy's questions when we were talking about it was、um, who gets left out, right?、Um, So, with that in mind,、uh, it also has to do with、uh, what Jan Ru you had said about the kind of inevitability of progress、um, or technological advancement or the increasing control, as you mentioned, that technology has on all of our lives. But then there is always, you know, two sides to the coin. And as Shuang has has、um, demonstrated so beautifully, is that of course technology is the space as much as it's a site of control. It's a site where we can find our Escapes, and it's not one or the other, right? That's the kind of reality of the situation.、Um, so, with that in mind, I wanted to ask you, and this is one of Billy's questions.、Um, again, for those of you who joined us, Billy Tang,、um, di director at Parasite, he was meant to moderate this talk. We worked on it together. He's unable to be here, so I'm, honor I'm honoring him.、Um, So, when thinking about the representation of real and virtual realities in relation to the 21st century Chinese world,、um, what is it? And I think here with the Chinese world, there's the Chinese-speaking world, but there's also the diaspora, right? Or the Chinese adjacent or Greater China.、Um, what is at stake here?、Um, is it possible to work critically beyond the fetishization of the future? Do we need a term like sinofuturism? You know what I mean? Is it useful to you in any way? This is an open question. Um, I think I can maybe answer this. Is that we have this year's Xiangyan Fest, and there are many Chinese diaspora, Taiwanese diaspora artists. That I think we are thinking about a point, a return. 就是当你回到，它其实也不一定是一个 diaspora 的一个概念，或是离开遥远的国度再回到你自己的家乡，也有可能是你远去另外一个城市工作，回到乡下，它都是一个这样子的 return。那我觉得这个 re t u r n 它其实也是回到，也许我刚刚在讲到，就是一个你原来很熟悉，但是其实后来变得不熟悉的一个概念。那我觉得透过。我不知道这个东西它的连接都是跟我们现在在讨论这个技术性，它不断的，当你不断的在往前走，不断的这个这个 acceleration， 这个 progress， 它到底是到了一个什么样的极限的时候？我觉得人还是要回去去思考，说你自己呃所处在你可以控制，或是你，我觉得那个厘清现实的复杂性是一个很重要的一个，尤其是。也许疫情之后，我们越越来越多人想要去更深刻去思考的一个问题，就是当你不断在追寻这个技术，或是你要被拉着走的时候，你有一个什么样的抵抗？那我觉得李爽他的这个 escapism， 其实某种程度上也许跟现在，尤其过去几年的这种躺平或者是 quiet resignation 是有关系的。但其实那不是一个撤退或是放弃，它反而是一种一种 degrowth。就是 degrowth 也不是不成长，它是一种慢的成长，而是我们是不是可以跟这个速度去进行一个拉扯，而不是
一定的二元论，就是零或一，大或小，而是在中间这个东西，我们是不是可以找到一种一种平衡？啊、uh, ，其实我不大 identify as escapism， 嗯， um, 我觉得可能在我的观察里面，中国或者是呃、uh, Gulf area 跟其他地方最大的区别，就比如说在欧洲，这个时间和空间是一个线性的概念，但是感觉在呃、uh, 中国，它是一个是一个 warped， 嗯、um, ，time and space is warped here and Within this warped area, there are like a lot of cracks or like loopholes that been created. And I think my work is about engaging. And but it was inspired by those at first. Um, 包括我们平时看快手，看我我不知道你们看不看，但是我看很多，<笑>我看很多 TikTok， 呃、uh, ，快手，然后你会看到很多在。呃，比较偏远的，或者是农村地区，有很多一些农村发明家，我觉得那些人都非常厉害，然后他们都发明非常，嗯，他们的 methodology 或者是一些用的工具都是比较 low tech、low fi， 然后。其实我也是这样定义我自己的作品，就是想用一个 low-fi 的一个 methodology 去 hack technocracy。嗯、um, ，就包括我们刚才看到的那个表演，就是一个非常简单的，呃，就是找二十个人穿一样的衣服，然后，但是它的这个 visual effects 反而是一个比较看起来好像是一个黑客帝国一样感觉。嗯、um, ，我觉得这是我作品想要取得的效果。But it's also really interesting when you mention that、um, the the performance, and it, and I just thought, oh, but you were cloning yourself, right? So there's also a real visual analogy for this idea that as global as things get, it becomes more homogenized. And you know, there was that image that you have of your work, which I loved, and it was like, marry me for Chinese citizenship. And like I joke about this a lot because you know, oh well, actually we can't do that because it's not legal to do that. <laughs> But you know what I mean, like to kind of bypass you know the laws that define who you are and what you're able to do, and to find ways to play around that. And that when Freya you mentioned defamiliarization, I may I thought about how yes, so de to be defamiliarized is almost to be alienated, right? And I think that when it when the world is so accelerated, it's so easy to feel alienated. And there is that pro maybe we're all going through a process of defamiliarization right now.、Um, and within that, I just suddenly started thinking、um, about the potential for reimagination, because then effectively we fall into a void, or we fall into a space, as you say, where you know space and time collapse, or they become so overdetermined. That we can't really connect to the idea anymore.、Um, I wonder if you guys had thoughts about this, John Ru. I hear, I see you. Um, uh, no, I actually I've always been very, very fond of Li Shuang's work. Uh, okay, yeah, because I think he, um, he uses a very artistic way, which is like, uh, because we're talking about, you know, you want to hack a system, you need to use a lot of tools, like software engineers, to open the system, you need to go inside it to fix some things. But he seems to be very simple, just using a very simple way of thinking. 呃，用一种人的逻辑去把这个系统给黑进去了，尤其是这样，像他有提到说，我我们在生活在中国的这个时间感知，它也许是呃，也不是一个线性的，那就意味着说，它可能技术的发展也并非是一个单线性的，它也许有非常多不同。呃，这种线性的呃不同的技术发展的一个方向，我们不能认为说，呃，农民的这个技术它也许就比呃这种什么科技公司的它要落后。呃，就像我我最近有一个嗯有一个田野考察，是去到呃广州的一个呃无人农业，就是呃他本来那个公司做无人机的。嗯、um, ，后来因为竞争不过大疆这种大品牌，他就专门去做无人农业。那么他，呃，他虽然看起来非常非常的高智慧，就是他有那种呃各种 sensor 去检测
啊，什么时候应该去收割，什么时候应该去浇灌，然后什么时候该播种，它都是用无人机去实现的，然后通过物联网的方式把它们联系起来。啊，但实际上他们有非常有一个不可控的东西，就是像最近广州在下大暴雨，它就没有办法进行这所有的一切，所以它还是要靠一个。呃，还是要观察自然，还是要观察，通过人去去介入这些植物的生长，还要去是非常通，就是这个这个 human labor 是无法被是无法被呃取消的，而且甚至呃他们所做的所有的东西，可能是基于农民几千年来的这些对于农业的大数据，然后去设计他们的系统，但同时间这个人的这个因素在这里面就是确实是没有办法被取代。所以我觉得，就是李爽的作品，他反倒是在今天我们在谈论科技的时候，呃，我们我们是到底是把这个机器视为一个系统，还是要把机器和人的关系视为一个整体的系统？它实际上是其实是一个呃，需要去从整体去考虑，重新去考虑我们对于技术的这种想象，重新去考虑我们对于跟跟技术的一个关系。I'd love to put that to Freya,、um, because I kind of think that relates a little bit to small world, and I'd like to probe it a little bit more, like how、um, how you're really conceiving of this exhibition, because actually, in many ways, what you're proposing is an after futurist show, right?、Um, but you're doing it, as you said, like you're not doing it by bypassing the problem or the question of future as it's sort of being produced in real time with the acceleration of technology. But you're kind of you had mentioned something about playing with the speed or finding another relationality to it. But I wanted to ask you about that in relation to what Jan Ru said and 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 what how Jan Ru beautifully engaged with Shuang Li's work. But I wanted to also think about that in relation to the local and the global, and these conceptions of space and time,、um, and how not just、uh, the, the 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 concept of、uh, a small world is. Confronting this kind of like digital reality that defines actually existing contexts,、um, but how that sort of manifests as a point of connection, right? For example, with Shuang Li, how she was saying, you know, when she grew up, she could connect with like kids in suburban America. You know, there's something really beautiful and powerful about that, and that's kind of where the screen comes in, right? As a metaphor. Um, as a tool, as a portal, and an exhibition, which can be seen in very similar ways. 嗯、呃，的确，我觉得的确，这个双年展，我觉得是对于未来是什么，我们是一个问号，但是我们也不敢去大胆去假设未来可能是什么。那我觉得这一个双年展，我们想要做的是，它是一个 invitation， 就是希望大家来这个展览，就是透过呃，其实我刚刚一直在讲，就是音乐，我们就是希望它作为一个 proto， 作为一个媒介，因为。呃，对于音乐，它可能是一个一次性的一个表演，呃，但是在一个我们那时候其实在思考说，就是，呃，我觉得在 pandemic 期间，就是 musician 他们其实最其实被 hit 的是最严重的，因为他们没有办法去做任何的 concert， 去做任何的表演。但是你去思考一下，一个做音乐创作的人，他一开始的初衷。只是想要做一个他自己很喜欢听的音乐，然后他的最终的目标可能只是希望传到听众的耳朵去欣赏他创作的音乐，就是他的起始点是很 intimate 的，最后他最终的起始点也是一个很 intimate， 但在这个中间他必须要经过一个非常庞大的一个 journey， 他要参加入加入了很庞大的一个工业商业体系、资本体系，然后你知道这种 rock star 他们要到处去。去巡回演出中间有多少的 drugs and you know just completely fuck up their lives. 但是他最终的目标其实只是为了要抵达一个很初衷，就是他的音乐让别人可以听得到。那我觉得我们是对于这样子的一个过程，他其实是很有兴趣。他并不代表说这个未来是一个不同的想象。那我觉得这个展览的确就是我们思考很多用音乐它作为一个 proto， 其实是在于说，呃，当一个呃，当音乐它被 Record 下来，他在透过重复的去呃播放。其实你每一次透过播放的时候，你听到的音乐都不一样。透过不管是你自己私人 intimate 的去聆听，或是是一个 collective 的聆听，每一个人他再一次听到的音乐都是不一样的。那我觉得我们希望这个东西去作为一个隐喻，是我们现在看到在影响未来的世界的。
同时，我们到底可以怎么样一而再、再而三不断的去？我觉得也是像李爽讲的，它其实是一个一个 hack， 它可以是在。中间你去找到这些 loophole， 你可能第一次看不到这个 loophole， 但是你看了不停的去看，看每一次之后，你会看到不同的点在哪里。那我觉得这是现在我们的社会，呃，就是这是一个 urgency， 我们必须要去去去处理、去面对的。那尤其以台北双年展是，当然是以台湾作为一个起始点，我们这样子一个小世界，我们希望。不管台湾现在被在一个什么样的一个 geopolitical 的 situation 之下，它有一个历史性的长期以来的一个危机、一个张力、一个矛盾，它一直以来都存在。也许现在是反而是更加的呃明显、更加的 prominent。但是未来是什么？我觉得我们现在没有一个人可以去 predict， 或是甚至大胆的去假设。可是也许对于我们现在存在这个危机展的中间，可以做的事情就是不断的去理解我们现在，不断的重新去看到底现实的问题是什么。呃，所以也许这是我们这个双人展想要去 propose 的，不是一个什么样的一个未来，而是在去往未来走的之前，我们可以做什么样的一个准备。Um, thank you. Wow, and that kind of actually brings in really nicely another of Billy's questions. Um, he's with us in spirit. Um, how do we hold out? So I think what you described. So his question is, how do we hold out for a critical space that allows us to reflect more deeply about the future and our role in it? And I'll add our place and time in it as well. Um, and I feel like what you've described is an exhibition that's attempting to hold that space or open that space. So I'm super curious um, with Jan Ru and, and Shuang,、um, how do you hold space? And also, I'm curious:、um, does the future really resonate in your thinking at all? You know, like because you, Shuang, your work is so embedded in that, you know. Maximalist plane of like all times and all spaces, everywhere, everything, everywhere, all at once of the the digital plane. You know what I mean?、Um, and then Jean Ru, it's almost the same. So I'm so curious how you guys would、um, reflect on that question, especially after what we've just heard Freya describe about the Taipei Biennial. <laughs>、uh, I I think I still have to speak from my own work experience. Um.、Uh, 可能会更加就是，呃，就是更更就是反正只能讲一下自己的工作。嗯<笑>、呃，其实我我们做 media lab 的时候，第呃每年都有一个年度的论坛。嗯、呃，我呃跟对呃跟许玉一起开发，因为大家都可能听过他讲这个 cosmo technique 就宇宙技术这个观点，非常红遍大江南北海外。呃，然后我、哦、其实我们第一期呃第一期做的。呃，这个议题，因为密电量嘛，感觉好像要做一些很呃高大上、很高精尖的东西。但我们其实第一期做的呃 lecture series 是是关于中医的。为什么要关于中医？我们今天来看中医，其实也是因为这个词也是非常危险，有点像 sino futurism 一样。呃，在 covid 期间被大家去嗯、呃，在用一种民粹主义的方式，在国内就是。就是有非常非常多两极的这种讨论，也是有点危险。嗯，呃，这里就不谈那些这这种争议的那个正确与否。但是我们想谈中医的一个原因是说，嗯，我们是想要重新在思考现代性的这个问题，因为当我们在讨论现代性的时候，我们依然还是在用一个相对二元的思路在去思考中国和这些技术的发展。嗯，那么，嗯，为什么？呃，为为什么中医就一定是传统的？为什么它就一定是落后的？其实这也是在我们这这其实也是一些我们还没有解决的现代性的问题。呃，所以当时我们有请到嗯、呃、三个这种呃医学人类学家，嗯呃，然后还有两个艺术家，台台湾的艺术家，他们做实践的，来分享他们关于呃中医的观点。但是他们在讲中医的时候，他们。并不是在讲中医有多么神奇，而是他在讲中医，其实在，在呃六七十年代，在全球的一个广泛的传播，在对，呃美国、欧洲的这种呃
呃这种认识论的影响。所以，其实综艺它也非常的有趣。如果你说它是一个非常传统的东西，但它实际上是影响了像呃欧洲的一些哲学家的一种认识论，然后它再反过来再影响，甚至像呃社会主义时期，像毛泽东所提出的这种整体思想，它可能都是跟这个中医早期在海外的一些传播有有关系的。所以我们可以看到这种知识的。呃，这种中国相对传这种传统知识的传播，它有一个非常长的一个链条，就它的技术是如何被传播，然后再回归到它原来发源地的时候，它可能已经呃完全吸收了很多外界的东西，然后它被生长成另外一种不一样的技术，所以我们永远都只能用一种嗯，用一种变动的眼光，或者是用一种。呃，不是当下那么当下的眼光来重新看待这个技术，所以当时，呃，我还记得我们请了台湾的那个呃张鑫，他们有一个小组“啰啰啰”小组，所以他们，呃，他们也给我们一个非常有趣的一个 practice。他是因为另外一个成员，呃，他是练形意拳的，呃，然后他把他把形他把传统的形意拳跟当代的一些科技产品结合起来。因为形意拳你是模仿动物的动物的呃动物的知识去发明一套功夫，但它实际上呃它借用了当今天的这种开源的方法，像李爽讲的这种人可以去黑镜技术的方式，它呃发明了一套呃当代的形意拳，它叫三 C 形意拳，就是这种三 C 产品，什么 computer con consume consumption， 就是就是一套这种电子产品。啊、呃，就是他发明这个产品，比如说你可以学习冰箱怎么工作，你可以学习屏幕怎么去工作，所以他其实是是人去在理解当代事物的时候，他也把它当做一个系统去学习，然后他用人的方式去黑进它，然后去打开它，然后再重新塑造了另外一个，所以其实这这就有点。就是很难把它理论化的来说，我们今天这个技术到底就是 AI 才是一个技术，还是说呃我们一个人的智慧也是一呃技术的一种？所以可能这是比较能够想到的一点，能够回应呃这个刚才 Seven Stephanie 提到的这个问题。Yeah, no, thank you, Jean Ru. No, so um, Shuang Li, the question was, how do we hold um critical space、uh, for us to reflect more deeply about the future and our role in it? And I, I was asking how um how you hold space for that in your work, or if, do you even hold do you even think about the future? Do you know what I mean? Is it something that you that even factors within your your thinking when you're in when you're like in the the realm of the digital and real all at once? I don't think it's something like I consciously think about.、Um, yeah, it just kind of happens. Yeah, that's that's great. <laughs> it works really well because Jan Ru, when you、um, responded, the thing that you said at the beginning, I'm going to stay with the practice because it's something solid. It sort of made me think about the ground,、um, and you know, this you mentioned Chinese medicine as well, which is such a beautiful metaphor because it reminds me of like conversations that. You can have, like, for example, with magic mushrooms, right? Like, who was the? How many? How many mushrooms? Bad mushrooms does someone have to take? And how many people had to like eat a poison mushroom before you finally got to a magic mushroom? Do you know what I mean? I'm sorry to use this analogy,、um, but it is. But it, it's a kind of a, a sort of metaphor for the working through, right? To actually understand the material that you're working with, to understand how things can affect other things in the actual material world. Um, it really does bring us back to the ground, back to practice, and and to the nuances. And one of the things that I've been really struck by, not just in this conversation, but in conversations we've had、um, this week, for example, with multi multipolarity as institutional practice, you know, that was a really big topic. It was about how do institutions navigate a world with many centers, right? There are different political systems, there are different ideologies, and yet we are an international community, and we have to find ways to work together. And that conversation went right down to food at the end, you know, because food is one of the most common and sort of most、uh, palpable ways that we can really understand what does、uh, enmeshment mean, like the, the the journey of one dish that finds its way into, you know, I don't know, like tzatziki or something from Greece that ends up in Persia or vice versa. Anyway,、um, my point being is.、Uh, It sort of really humanizes things, and I think what's so interesting is that 
um, how do I put this? I guess it comes back to that question of projection. And so actually what I'd like to ask you guys, and I'm gonna say to the audience as well, I'm gonna open this up to audience questions, so get thinking. Um, I'd love to know how, how you have, uh, how you've experienced this conversation, right? Based on the invitation that you had, the prompt, what was what, living between the real and virtual in Greater China after Sino-Futurism. Um, I wonder how this has informed any of your thinking, if at all, you know? What thoughts have come to your head during this talk that perhaps has affected the way that you came to this conversation in the beginning? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, one thing I'm thinking about right now is, um, is, is everything everywhere all at once sign of futurism? <laughs> <laughs> Would you consider that, um, yeah, Chinese uh, sign of futurism? Would I consider it? Like the movie. Oh. Nah, <laughs> not really. Would you, Freya, Janru? I don't think so. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> yeah, no, I think, like, for me, I think every, everything everywhere all at once sort of brings us back to how we started this conversation, which is it's just an explosion of realities, and any term that tries to define it will always be problematic. Um, so, I mean, I think we came to this knowing that, like, we, I think we all have a complicated relationship to this idea of Sino-Futurism. And, in fact, I have a complicated relationship with terms in general. Um, so, I guess, in a way, this comes to uh, my final question before I open it up to the audience. Um, when we had been discussing this talk uh, before we came on stage, Janru, you sort of put that question, you know, do we need another term? Are there other terms that are more useful? Um, to think about the, f and, and also like I'm even after this conversation thinking about the future, is it helpful at all to think about the future or do we actually need another term for that too? It reminds me of the artist Jesse Darling who uh, always talks about working through, right? So not instead of pushing forward, you're working through. And maybe that also changes the way, your relationship to space and time. So I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts. Uh,三的Futurism这个词确实我自己认为也是有些问题的,因为它总是向你提到,它总是投射在一个未来,似乎当下没有那么重要,我们可能一直在努力的工作,然后未来有更好的生活,对吧?就我们父母那一辈是这
理解，不管是呃中医或者是这个地方的时候，就是我们要接受它不很难被被准确描述的那一部分，就像是呃你所说的，就是我们要永远要回到这个过程当中去，嗯、呃，体验说这个世界到底它会变成什么样。所以问题就是我们要接受这种。呃，也许中文或者是中文世界的博大精深，它是有很大的一部分是很难被呃这种词去准确的去捕获的，或者是我们要需要用很多很多不同的词再来去去去讲述它，就是但是我们不能够轻易的接受这样一个词，然后再去内化它，然后用它来表述自己，就是这个是也许我觉得不能接受的这个词的一个点。对，我也很同意吴建如说的，因为，呃，其实，呃 ，to be honest， when like sinofuturism, g o l f u t u r i s m when all these different terms come about, I remember that was an exciting time to see all these different narratives coming out. That's not something stereotypical, like doesn't exist before. But I think the problem is like if you're like stagnating within this term and.、Um, I've actually been talking to Sofia Almeria recently, who coined the term、um, Gulf Futurism,、um, and she mentioned that she has got identity politics out of the way in her early works. And when you look at her recent work, it's not like she doesn't talk about it anymore. It's just it's way more subtle and like way deeper, not necessarily deeper, just way more subtle. And I agree that's how. Yeah, you should like move forward and not just like stay with it.、Um, thank you for mentioning that actually, because I remember when Gulf Futurism came out as a term, and me being from Hong Kong and having grown up in like I'm, I always say I'm a New Town girl. I grew up in Fort Han, and then I I live in Tong Chung now. So from New Town to New Town,、um, and when you know Gulf Futurism came out and it was trying trying to kind of like create a framework to understand this sort of like. Super capitalistic construction of a city space, right? And the capitalist can、uh, the 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 merger of capital and culture and the actual shaping of、uh, a city or a, a a nation state. But I wouldn't go so far because Gulf Futurism really is concentrated in the cities, right? It's in the the sky. It, it's like so. Hong Kong is a futurist space in that way, and as is Singapore and other places. And it was really energizing, actually, at that time. And it was used a lot. It, it gave us a new language. It gave us a kind of shorthand to get to somewhere real quick. Because also, Gulf Futurism was about the way、uh, new cultures were being formed through a global network. And、um, with you, what I've noticed today, it's amazing how you switch between English and Chinese. <laughs> You know, and it's so natural to you. And I think that you know, you're not alone. There's so many people who who do this because of the way that they've engaged with the on with the online world,、um, which it sort of relates to Freya what you said about finding ways to play with these systems because eventually they will, as you said, it's eventually going to define us in some way. So how is it going to define us?、Um, yeah, interesting because also then what you brought up, Shuang, is these terms. They're useful for their moment, and then I guess we have to decide when we have to. Say goodbye, or redefine them. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that, Freya? I think the modern art scene has too many terms. It's like a fruit basket. It's like all the terms are too many. But I think that I think another thing that I have to think about. I think that through this panel, I think that the question is a choice. It's a choice. 我们到底能选择吗？我需要去选择吗？我可以选择吗？或者我能选择吗？就是因为区域的关系，或是地域的关系，或什么原因，今天就是必须要去。你好像就是 s i g n a l f u t u r i s m 它这种就变得是你被被框架下来的，你就必须要去讨论。那呃，所以我觉得没有一个答案。我只是今天一直在思考，就是我到底有多少的 agency 可以去选择。I think I think we can just not talk about it anymore. <laughs>、um, I mean, that, on that note,、um, I would welcome、uh, questions from the audience. If anyone has anything they'd like to ask the panel, we have an incredible group of thinkers here. Yeah, we have one here at the back. Hello. Hi. Sorry. Thank you very much.、Um, About Frazier, you mentioned 
uh, Plato Cave. One of the slaves went outside and understand what is the reality that you know, right? All right, for your next exhibition, do you think you will be connected more with the people who will not understand reality? Because the reality is virtual at the moment. All right, second things. Um, there is a room, very big, and there is a spotlight, cinema spotlight on the floor with nothing else, pointing on the floor. Under the spotlight, there is a flame with a candle, but no one can see the candle and the flame because the spotlight over flame, the candle. So, do you think any way to escape in the freedom from the framing system of what you're talking about before? Because digital is not a fire. Fire is not digital. This is a statement, because it's real, not because it's not my idea. I was kind of hypnotized by the way you talk. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the questions that we want to um, explore through our binary. I think for... Um, Part of one of the important intention is to understand the complexity of the reality. Um, so this is, I think, what Plato's. Uh, we were interested in how th these prisoners was shifting in, seeing the shadows in the cave, and then understand what is outside is absolutely nothing. You know, so this is something, the question that uh, is a philosophical question that uh, we are all asking ourselves. And through the bio, hopefully we can, not necessarily to find the answer, but if we can keep on asking ourselves, we look at the unfamiliar reality that we've never noticed before. Um, that's the invitation that we would like to send out. I don't know if that answers your question. Is the, anyone else like to ask a question? Uh. Lady, ladies first, maybe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think I, I, was, I, I learned so much from the conversation today, so I want to thank all of the speakers. Um, I This is my first time coming to Hong Kong, and um, as I walked along the street in Kowloon and Mongog, I think about the Ron Carway movie I've seen. And I think about um, these characters and these Cantonese dialogues. And I, um, I was asking myself, why do these words give me so much feeling? Um, why don't I feel so much from other plays, uh, whether it be in the Bay Area in San Francisco or Beijing or other place. And um, we we're talking about the, the term enmeshment today. And I think about that in terms of the artist's life and also um, the enmeshment of different cultures. Um, and I think my question is sort of are, what are the things that can stay unenmeshed in a time of enmeshment um, of ge geopolitical space? culture, songs, words. And I also want to ask those who are more familiar with Hong Kong um, whether there is a, a magical reason as to why Hong Kong is such a space that gives people a feeling of unenmeshment in the time, in, in its enmeshed history. Yeah, I don't know if it makes sense. 
um, but these are some of, some of my feeling prior to this conversation and some of my questions aroused as hearing the speak, um, you know, the, the thoughtful conversation. Yeah. I wonder if you could just elaborate on how you, how you conceptualize feeling unenmeshed in Hong Kong's enmeshment. It's pretty beautiful, but I, I'd love to know more. Um, I think I feel like um, like 30% of my life is grounded in what I see, and 70% of that is grounded in what I associate with certain place. And I feel like Hong Kong is a place that uh, that in my mind has a lot of association. As I mentioned, the Ron Carway movies and you know the the movies from the Jing Fei Pian from um, like. Uh, and these movies and you know I was carrying my suitcase because you know, I, I came from Beijing to Shenzhen to Hong Kong yesterday and my flight was delayed for three hours and I was so sleep deprived and I, as I carried my suitcase and walked along these streets and I just feel um, and I just like like these streets just give me the feeling of the movies so I feel like that's something that has already become a cultural symbol and that's very Hong Kong it's not it's not like any other, like Chinatown and other place. Um, it's very specific, yeah. I mean, I feel like you just described living between the real and the virtual. <laughs> you know, uh, it's that when you said it's like 30% reality and then the 70% association, I wondered is this how, it's quite interesting to think about how that's maybe a way that we do filter our way through the world. Um, yeah, I mean, coming from Hong Kong myself um, and being enmeshed um, by nature, I can say that, uh, yeah, it's kind of an explosion of associations as everything everywhere always is really, depending on who you are. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for your wonderful speeches. Um, so I'm actually, reading the topic today through the lenses of kind of post-humanism. So first of all, the sign of futurism to me is kind of like a categorized definition. It's about sign of uh, maybe uh, China, or something like that. So I'm just, imagine, I'm just imagining if there, is, uh, if there are any possibilities to have a futurism without any categories. So this is my uh, first idea. Uh, my second idea is about uh, the uh, the second half of the topic, living between real and virtual. Um, so for me, reality and virtuality is something like a kind of a super superposed or like a superposition. So I'm just uh, curious about uh, if if anyone has some ideas about kind of like a, the superposition of uh, kind of virtuality and uh, the reality. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. I will try to answer. Um, so there is a futurism in the history, where it's in, um, I think it's in Italy. Yeah. yeah, it's in Italy. So at that time, the artists, um, they actually made a lot of work that responds to also the de development of the technology at that time. So there is a futurism. So adding this signal uh, ahead, I guess, as we all discuss, so um, it's kind of putting a lot of uh, label or symbol or a lot of uh, imagination in front of that technology or in front of this um, development of the technology. So it's kind of fascinating, and but it's also we really have to careful about why people want to add this <coughs> signal ahead of it. <clears throat> do you really want to accept it, or do you um, have like uh, more reflection of the history? Or, I mean, um, you have to really careful about why people want to consume, why people want to uh, sell the concept to you. And yeah, I that's how I can think about. It. Yeah, and if I can add as well, like it's also important to remember that Italian futurism became closely associated with fascism and the war machine. And you know there are many different futurisms. Not all the futurisms were the same. There's Afrofuturism, Gulf futurism, and maybe that's the superimposition, right? The, the, and again, it kind of speaks to what we've been talking about this entire time, which is 
everything everywhere <laughs> all at once. I'm so sorry. But it's just a very good shorthand, but maybe we'll get bored of that title one day too. I hope that answers your question. Um, do we have any other questions? If not, I think, um, please can you join me in thanking um, our amazing panel for their generosity. And thank you so much to the audience for staying with us.